Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and, well, lovely. Now, this week's show, we have a new project from Mitzella. Actually, it's one of his old projects on his YouTube channel. His videos are so few and far between, and they're always amazing. And um, we'll also be talking about the controversy surrounding the Raspberry Pi OS update. It's now pinging home to Microsoft, and a lot of people are very angry. And, of course, we will be looking at some things on funding websites and giving a prize away from the mystery box. But for now, let's get on with the show. So we're going to start this week's show talking about the controversy surrounding the Raspberry Pi OS upgrade. Um, if you haven't come across it, um, in very, very short terms, the Raspberry Pi OS update now pings to a Microsoft Git repository, and there is a certain amount of te telemetry involved, which will give Microsoft information about you, i.e. that you are a Raspberry Pi user. Um, now, to some of you, that might not seem like a big deal. To some of you, that will seem like a horrendous and terrible thing. I'm going to try and not give too much of my opinion on this, because ultimately, at the end of the day, um, I think more important is that you understand what is happening and whether it affects you, whether it's something you should be upset about. So this Reddit thread on the Linux subreddit is where I first read about this. It's been widely reported since, um, but I realize I've probably already said something false. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this just so you can see exactly where this story came from and make up your own mind about it. Now, um, in a recent update, the Raspberry Pi Foundation installed a Microsoft app repository on all machines running Raspberry Pi OS, previously known as Raspbian, without the administrator's knowledge. First important point, um, Raspberry Pi OS and Raspbian are two separate projects, so if this is something that really upsets you, please don't get upset with the uh, people who make Raspbian, they're now nothing to do with Raspberry Pi OS, separate projects, as far as I know, Raspbian is not the same, it's completely safe. Um, officially it's because they uh, endorsed Microsoft's IDE, but you'll get it even if you installed from a light image and use your Pi headless without a GUI. This means that every time you do apt update on your Pi, you are pinging a Microsoft server. Um, now, the, the bit that I am happy uh, to kind of condense down and just say in a single sentence, because I don't think there's any way I can say this all that wrong, is that every time you uh, update your operating system or install your operating system on a new Raspberry Pi, um, a certain amount of information is pinged to a Microsoft server, and so they will know you are using a Raspberry Pi, and therefore can target adverts to you that are to do with the Raspberry Pi. Now, um, some of you might think that's not a big deal whatsoever. Some of you might be absolutely horrified right now. Um, I'm not going to come down on any particular side of the about this, but I will point out that I am a, a creator who uses various operating systems, including Windows and Microsoft. I use VS Code when I'm coding, but by the same token, I am a Linux user and have been for years. I'm the editor of Linux on a uh, website. Uh, I understand the FOSS side of things as well. Um, I definitely have a foot in both camps, and I'm not going to be coming down hard on either side. Rather than spend a lot of time on this, I urge you to go and read everything you can about it and make up your own mind about it. If you are, like me, a user of various different devices, and uh, Microsoft has a lot of data about me already, I am not going to stop using Raspberry Pi OS because of this, um, but you might want to and uh, read everything you can about it. Um, because one thing is true is the way that this was done, the way that this was added to Raspberry Pi OS was definitely a little bit shady. Um, there wasn't really documented. If it hadn't been noticed, I don't think they would have talked about it. And if they're willing to add something to their um, API repository uh, without telling us you know what else would they add I completely understand that is a large security issue for some people um, we'll definitely be coming back to this as it develops Raspberry as far as I know the Raspberry Pi Foundation as far as I know haven't said anything about it as yet um, but it's very rare that we cover a sort of news-esque story like this on uh, this show um, and I hope I did it in a way that neither bored you or made you angry <laughs> um, but yeah um, I'll leave a link to this in the description I'm very interested to hear what you think about it now, moving on to a product that uses the Jetson AGS Xavier module. Now, that is the super high-powered um, single-board computer that NVIDIA have released. Um, if you have used the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, you will be familiar with this. It's just the same, but a lot chunkier and capable of a lot more. So this is the NRU110V, or NRU110 volts, I'm assuming. Um, it's from a company called Neo Neosys. I'm, I know I'm pronouncing that terribly, and I apologize. This is essentially an incredibly ruggedized case for the uh, Xavier module, the AGX Xavier module, um, which makes use of the fact that the Xavier module can take up to eight cameras uh, using a system called GMSL. Now, I haven't had any hands-on experience with this. I've only read up a little bit about it, but um, from what I can understand, it is a protocol that NVIDIA uses that allows you to have many, many cameras that are all powered via the coaxial port, and um, they can all... Uh, in a special video we multiplex you way, I guess, uh, talk to the Xavier at the same time. Essentially, you can have eight different cameras for different kinds of object tracking and recognition. And if you're thinking autonomous self-driving vehicle, that's also what they are thinking while making this. 
Um, the idea being this is a rugged outdoor box that can be used for various stuff. It is IP67 rated, which is, as far as I know, like rated against pretty much everything, uh, including dust, ingress, water, and some uh, quite high temperature swings. Um, and yeah, um, as it says here, uh, outdoor AI applications that require continuous interaction with surroundings in dynamic lighting conditions, including autonomous driving, mobile robots, precision agriculture, intelligent V2X, and teleoperation. So this clearly probably isn't aimed at people like me. Um, I have no need to make something like this, but it is very interesting to someone like me who has the smaller brother of the Xavier. Um, I have a Jetson Nano sitting over there, and way back in the days when I had more time, I was hoping to make an autonomous self-driving robot out of it. If you are someone who is looking to prototype something uh, for industrial use, um, this is something that might interest you. And even if you're not, I find these things quite fascinating to read about. I imagine you will too. So I will leave a link to the Linux Gizmos article in the description. Um, just so you know, uh, at the bottom of this article, there are also links to the actual announcement from Neo Neosis. Sorry. Um, and uh, also the uh, page where you can buy one, although as it stands right now, um, there is not actually any information. I believe you'll have to get in touch with the company if you would like a quote. Now we're going to move on to funding website things, and we'll be starting with Komu, which is a quite familiar tiny little development board. And when I say quite familiar, it is because it looks very, very similar to the previous three boards, which had very similar names to this. Komu is a microcontroller with an EFPGA um, that fits inside your USB port. Um, and uh, on the end here, um, if it's anything like the old ones, uh, this little bit is going to be a, a way of uh, interfacing with it and also can work using capacitive touch. Now, we previously featured, I believe, FOMU on the show, although they have such similar names, I'm not absolutely certain. Um, uh, these things obviously all follow a theme, all fit inside the USB port of your computer, um, and all of them, as you can see, have done very, very well. But yes, in short, this is an absolutely tiny development board which uses a QuickLogic EOS S3 system on chip um, with an ARM Cortex M4 F MCU and an embedded FPGA. Um, uh, in short, as it says here, um, it's not just an MCU or an FPGA, it's a complete system on chip that fits inside a USB port for development. Now, I've talked in the past about the fact that I'm not 100% familiar with um, the entire uh, ecosystem of working with the FPGAs, the tool chains involved, um, uh, all of it really, because as someone who doesn't work in the industry, I barely have time to learn the basic tool chains for most of the microcontrollers I talk about. Um, I wish I had more time to do it, but the sad fact of it is, is unless someone else is paying me to do it as a job, I'm not going to have the time to do all of that. And it's the same with FPGAs. So um, uh, I sort of have to trust them when they say that their open source tools are uh, special in some way or other. And one of the things it says is it completely uh, differentiates itself by the fact that it is so widely supported by open and free tool chains which of course is going to be very important if you're someone who's wanting to learn this on a budget in your spare time someone kind of like me for example but yes, out of all of these, free RTOS is the one that I guess I'm the most familiar with, and it is supported on Komu. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, open hardware and design tools. The entire thing is an open hardware project, as so many things are on CrowdSupply. You could theoretically get all of the uh, bits you need to make one of these yourself. But as always, why would you? Because you can just support the people that have made it. So the full specifications are listed here, but as you can see, um, you have the QuickLogic system on chip, along with uh, 16 megabits of flash memory, an RGB LED, and these four touchpads, as I mentioned before. So the Como campaign have asked for a symbolic one dollar uh, in funding. Um, they've made so many of these boards, they're going to make them. This is just a convenient place you can go and order one. Um, and if you would like to, they are only forty dollars with the molded case. You'll have to pay a bit extra for shipping depending on where you are. Um, and as I think I said about the last board, um, which was another tiny uh, embedded FPGA board, um, I believe called Tomu, um, this seems like a fantastic way of getting started. I have uh, one of the tiny ones over here and um, to my shame, this is one of the many things I bought that I still haven't had time to even start look into um but uh, yeah if you're interested in uh, this uh, dual system on chip mcu fpga um and you would like to get one this is where you can go um also uh, just to remind you the crowd supply discord has a lot of people in it who are makers uh, on crowd supply there to answer questions and talk uh, talk to um it's a fun place to hang out um but yes i will leave a link to this in the description of this video we're going to move on now to dmark which is an open source arm based development board now, there's a number of things about DMARC I find interesting. The first being that the uh, inputs and outputs on the board are what they call a curated set of inputs and outputs designed to best leverage the uh, chip, which is an STM32 chip. I think it's the STM32 F070RB, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, yeah, this curated set of inputs and outputs is designed to mean that you don't need spaghetti everywhere on your desk to learn how to put together the kind of hardware you want to make. 
Um, that, I think, is a very nice idea. It's by no means unique, but it is nice that, uh, to have a completely curated board, as they call it. I think curated is a good word for that. The other side to this board that I find utterly fascinating is the fact that they've created their own interpreted language to program it with, meaning that you can program it a little bit like you would MicroPython or some of the embed software stuff, in that you, um, you write the software and then you move it onto the SD card and then it will run from the SD card reader. Um, presumably you can do that directly over serial as well. I haven't looked into it that far yet. Um, but yeah, that's the part that I find really, really fascinating. But before we get to that, let's quickly go over this. Um, this is what I was talking about with the curated set of inputs and outputs. Um, uh, there's various things that you will find familiar on this uh, in terms of ports. Um, and uh, this little uh, thing here, in case you were wondering, this is where you can attach a stepper motor driver, which I believe you buy separately. Um, but most of everything that you would need uh, for getting started with various forms of digital and analog inputs and outputs are on the board already. Now, the full list of uh, various inputs and outputs and features of this board can be found here. I'm not going to go through all of them now. Two things I find uh, nice. Uh, one is the uh, wide input variety for voltage. If I remember correctly, it's between 9 and uh, nine and 24 volts input. That's nice. That means you can work with a variety of voltages. It means you can work with a variety of peripherals that might also need external voltages. I like that. Uh, the second thing is the fact that it has the 80 tiny 84 uh, microcontroller on it as a bridge between the chip and all of the sensors. Um, so it's pre-programmed to work as a transparent input and output, but of course you can reprogram that yourself. And one of the things they sell is a programmer for that chip. Now, I want to move on from the hardware because what I find the most interesting thing about this is what they are calling the DMSI firmware, DMARC Script Interpreter. Now, unless I'm being stupid, I can't find all that much information about DMSI, the firmware, but there is a link to uh, their GitHub page here on the uh, Crowd Supply page. And uh, from there, I went through into the documentation and found a uh, schematic and a script reference. And looking at it, it seems like a fascinating idea. The closest analogy I can come to is MicroPython, where you write your code and then you move it onto the board and it is interpreted in real time. Um, as it says here, it's been designed to uh, make the DMARC controller board run without programming, compiling, and flashing. Rather than existing fully, pro fully featured programming language like C and C++ et al., DMS is simply plain text served in a media, i.e. microSD, con containing configuration part and a command part, and simple conditional syntax. So I think I've waxed lyrical enough about how interesting I find this. There is some example code here. Um, I suggest you go and look at it if you find this as fascinating as I do. Um, and in terms uh, of the thing itself, um, as I mentioned, um, they, uh, they, yeah, they, they really want this to be an open hardware board that can be used by various people of different levels. So the board itself is $89. Um, you can get it directly from Crowd Supply. This is another one of the ones, by the way, that has um, a, a, a symbolic $1 goal. Um, but the board itself is $89, and I think that's actually pretty uh, damn good in terms of uh, value. There's a lot on this board already. If you got this, even just to learn how to program STM32 chips normally, um, you would probably find that you would get a lot out of this board. Um, they also have this uh, stepper uh, motor driver module, which attaches here, as I mentioned um, on the uh, thing below, you can see where that attaches. Um, the separate module will run stepper motors up to two amps, and they have the programmer clamp, which is for the AVR, the little 80 tiny chip, if you want to reprogram the way that works. Anyway, I've spent longer on this than I meant to. Um, there'll be a link to this in the description. Uh, DMARC, fascinating to me for two separate reasons, both of them very cool. It is time for the mystery box competition, and we now have a mystery box once again. It has been refilled. Now, the first mystery is which of the many boxes is the mystery box? I, I know, it's not a mystery, I know, wait, I'll be back. Yes, new mystery box. Um, and in case I've never said this before, um, Mauser provide our mystery box prizes. Thank you very much, Mauser. Um, if I had to give away my own collection, there wouldn't be a collection left and I couldn't afford to do it. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if you ever wondered why we have a box of mystery stuff to give away, it's because Mauser gave it to us. Um, now, uh, the mystery box competition, in case you are not familiar with it, uh, I haven't had one for a few weeks, so let's go over it again. This is a box of mystery. It says mystery box on it. Um, and inside it, there are a mixture of microcontrollers, uh, single board computers, uh, little USB USB accelerator type sticks. Uh, in the last mystery box we had some 3D depth sensing camera things. Um, they're the cool prizes that you can win. On the other end of the scale there are uh, peripherals and things that attach to these things that can be given away that you might not even own. Like there might be a shield for a microcontroller that you don't own, don't know how to get, um, and you might win that as a prize too. Um, the good thing about it is entering this competition is completely free. You just leave a comment on the video that you are watching. If you are watching this week's video, leave a comment and in next week's video we will choose someone from the comments at random to win a prize from the mystery box. So with all that out of the way, let's get the first prize out of this mystery box.
So, going for a good rummage. I'm going to start halfway down the box on the side, because as I said, there is one of them I did see at the top, and I don't want to pull that out straight away. Uh, let's see what this is. What are you? Spark Fun RFID Starter Kit. Oh, cool. Ah, okay, I think I know what this is. This is the Spark Fun version of the popular RFID add-on kits you can get for various microcontrollers. I don't know exactly which one this is based on, however, but... Oh, cool. Oh, no way, this is a USB version. Okay, this is extremely cool. Um, this is a little baseboard that attaches to your computer via USB. Uh, since it's in a little sealed packet, I'm going to leave it so I'm not going to pull it out. Um, but yes, there's a little uh, USB serial chip on there and some uh, little pin headers for attaching. This guy, the uh, ID12LA, I was just reading about it, I should have remember that, which fits on top of it, which is an RFID reader. And then in the box here, you also have a couple of cards. Um, and it is incredibly simple. You open up a Minicom or Putty or whatever you use to connect to things, connect to it via serial and hold up a card and it will give you a readout of the unique card ID. This being a SparkFun product, there's a lot of uh, documentation for it as well. In fact, I noticed uh, on the actual page here, um, uh, you can click a link to this video, which is an RFID comparison on the SparkFun YouTube channel, um, which talks about the uh, the protocol, how it works, and uh, tests a few of them. Uh, but anyway, this is a very, very cool prize indeed. But yes, we have a prize, and now we need a prize winner. And the winner this week is Al Watt, who left a comment on last week's video about the Ara Decker 10 development board um, because it's come down in price so dramatically, mentioning it has better support, uh, unlike the Vidor 4000, which is a board I'm familiar with. However, um, the actual amount of support these boards have is something I'm not so familiar with, but I probably will be soon because, uh, somewhat predictably, with the Decker 10 being so cheap, I have ordered one. Um, but anyway, uh, congratulations, Al. We'll be in touch with you as to how we can get this out to you. Um, as I said before, any comment left on the video uh, will enter you into the mystery box competition. But for now, let's get on with the show. We're going to close out this week's show by looking at a few notable projects from this week, beginning with an upgrade to an old original iPod, of course using a Raspberry Pi. This Review Geek article gives a very good rundown of what's happening here. Um, so as you can see from the image, this is an original iPod with what looks like a very original menu, but it's not. Um, the, it's been completely replaced on the inside with a Raspberry Pi Zero and a screen, and it is now a Spotify-powered Bluetooth music player. So as I say, this article will give you a good rundown of it, and I will leave a link to this in the description. Um, but Guy Dupont, who is the maker behind this, has a YouTube channel and a 15-minute video which uh, show showcases uh, how this thing works and how it was built. Um, uh, one thing that is very cool about this um, is the dial that you can see there. Um, some of you may have that nostalgic memory of iPods having that clicking sound when you would move the dial around. Now that clicking sound has been replaced with a small vibration motor. You get haptic feedback now when you uh, change the dial, which I think is a wonderful little touch. So there's not all that much more for me to say about this project. Go and check out Guy's video. Um, there is also a Hackaday uh, post about it, which goes through it all, um, along with a GitHub uh, page, which has all of the code for it, if you want to try and make something like this yourself. Um, but this is just another fantastic example of taking relatively old tech and putting a Raspberry Pi in it to make it do lovely new things. And you all know how much of a fan I am of that. Up next, we have a project on the Electromaker website, and it is from KDDIY Projects. Uh, and this is an automatic CNC-style drawing machine. Now, I say CNC-style because um, it uses an Arduino CNC shield, and it is powered by an Arduino Uno, um, using two stepper motors, much in the same way a CNC machine would work. Um, but rather than the drill head coming up and down, there is a small servo, which brings the pen up and down. Um, now, there's a lot of these kind of machines around that you may have seen. This one uh, has an incredible amount of precision, uh, and I can show you that. The video on the build page shows exactly what this thing can do, and it is very, very precise. Um, as you can see here, these geometric shapes that it's drawing are near perfect, um, and the video doesn't just show off what it can do, it takes you through everything. It takes you through where you can get the STL files for these 3D printed parts, because it is all 3D printed. It's entirely manufactured um, at home, as it were. If you have a 3D printer, you could get just a few extra parts to make this. Really, all you need is the two stepper motors, uh, the Arduino Uno, the shield, and some linear rods, uh, and then you can print the parts yourself. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be the cheapest thing in the world to build, but you can get a lot of this stuff on AliExpress for next to nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as you can see here, Arduino Uno, CNC Shield, and the rest of the video goes through in great detail every single thing you need to do in order to build it and put it together. Um, I do not have the time to show you this entire video. I suggest you head to this link and watch it because this is a fantastic build. Um, and if you have a 3D printer and want to make something like this yourself, this is an achievable thing that if you printed the 3D parts ahead of time, this would be an afternoon's work. You could make this a weekend project and then you would also have a very cool drawing machine. And you know, with a little bit of reprogramming, you could make it do, well, pretty much anything. 
And finally, on this week's show, a new video is out from Mitzella. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, Mitzella is a person who works with microcontrollers to make musical instruments in the most wonderful and inventive ways. Um, he has a, a fantastic website and blog which covers how all these things work and a YouTube channel as well. Um, needless to say, I am very much a fan of his um, and every video that he puts up is very exciting. This one is no exception at all. Now, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with Mitzella, uh, some of the things he has done in the past include making a fully functional MIDI controller, which is also a business card and a stylophone. Uh, you'll have to go to his channel to see how that works. Um, he made the world's smallest MIDI synthesizer, which fits inside a DIN connector using an STM32 chip. The video of the uh, how that was made is just astonishing. It's a very long introduction to the thing itself, and then an explanation about how he got it working on such low power, because it uses a parasitic power using the DIN connector. Um, I could talk for a very, very long time about uh, the projects that Mitzella has done. Um, I do not have the time to do that. This video, however, is about the humble slide whistle. So yes, uh, Mitzella has made an automatic slide whistle. Um, and as you can see, it uses a couple of servos um, uh, along with a little driver board there. Um, air blows in one end and there is a baffle to stop the notes. Um, I would rather you go and watch his video than listen to my explanation of it, partially because, um, yeah, it's it's astonishing. Every one of his videos is. If it sounds like I'm gushing a bit, I am. Um, the, the level of detail he goes into with his project is something that um, I find incredibly inspiring um, and uh, also a little bit intimidating. Um, uh, yeah, it, the entire, channel is a gold mine this video is absolutely no exception this is actually an old project of his he just forgot to show off um he seems to just be that kind of guy uh, so yes this video uh, explains how it works and also uh, shows off various different ways of playing it it also shows off one of his other inventions which is also just an astonishingly wonderful thing so this is another one of his inventions. Um, this little machine on the right is uh, essentially one of those turning handle machines that makes a tune, uh, like a, a music box tune, although it's one that takes punch cards. Um, so theoretically you can play any note. Um, but instead of using punch cards, as you can see, he set up a bunch of servos to trigger each one of those notes. Um, he has an entire separate video on that, by the way, which I suggest you watch because it is also marvellous. Um, I, I Yeah, I really, if you take one thing away from this week's show, Go to Mitzella's uh, channel and watch this video, uh, but I do warn you, if you do, be prepared to spend a little bit of time there because you will want to watch all of the rest of them. He does not upload videos all that often, but every time he does, they are uh, inspiring, wild, and uh, yeah, he's the very definition of the uh, eccentric genius inventor, if you ask me. Um, if I sound like I'm being a bit of a fanboy, it's because I absolutely am. So that is our show for this week, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, the Electromaker Show will be back next week. And um, of course, we never manage to fit everything we want to in these shows. We only have a limited amount of time. If we've missed something you thought was amazing that you've seen this week, please do leave it in the comments section below. And also be interested to hear what you guys think of the Raspberry Pi OS controversy situation that's going on right now. But um, as always, I hope you have a productive and safe and healthy week. And I will see you in the next one.